if ESG becomes an exercise in data gathering and tilting portfolios slightly greener or, or some other way, um, I, I think that's where it starts in the wrong place. Hello, I'm Natalie Kenway, Global Head of ESG Insights at ESG Clarity, and welcome to this two-part video series where I speak to Stuart Dunbar at Bailey Giffords. Thank you very much for joining me, Stuart. Good morning. Nice to be here. Stuart has written a new paper called The Rise of ESG, outlining what he believes is the role of an ESG fund manager in terms of supporting the creation of a more sustainable global economy. This year, with new regulation coming into force in the UK and Europe, there has been a lot of focus on data and disclosure, but Stuart writes in the paper that quantitative snapshots of individual companies should be a starting point for discussion rather than a measure of system-wide progress. But I'll let Stuart talk all about it. So firstly, what motivated you to write the, this paper? and What were you trying to explain or find out? This is quite a big answer, but I, I mean it um, sort of without at all being hubristic about it. Is I'm, I'm quite worried that these really meaningful challenges that society has, in particular the environment is the one that everyone's focused on at the moment, but much more widely than that, are in danger of not being addressed. So we as an industry have somewhat, are, are going down the route, I think, of reducing ESG investing, responsible investing, however we care to describe it, as an exercise in metrics. And I, I can see this happening amongst, you know, um, clients and consultants and all sorts of people who, to be very clear, everyone's very well intended in tackling some of these things. But if ESG becomes an exercise in data gathering and tilting portfolios slightly greener or, or some other way, um, I, I think that's where it starts in the wrong place. I mean, we, we've, we've spoken in the past as a firm about what does investing mean? We call it actual investing. It's about the real world. It's not about the world of stock markets. It's not about the world of data. It's what are people doing in the real world that achieves real change? And my concern, genuine concern, is if we actually seriously want to address climate change in particular, the, the focus has to be on what are people actually doing in the real world. Now, a, a sort of quantitative snapshot approach to that, even if you try and identify trends, of course, um, I just think it's focusing very much in the wrong place. So for me, you know, the, the data has a, has a purpose. I mean, so, someone cleverer than me said, you know, Data, data helps helps to illuminate, but only judgment solves problems. Um, and I just sort of see this. I think it's quite a dangerous trend, actually, of reducing the thing to numbers and not solving problems. And 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 if we do that, we've completely missed the point of what um, ESG is supposed to be about. Mm, yes, that, that makes sense. Um, thank you for explaining that. So the paper identifies several shortcomings in quantitative approaches to ESG. Can you explain those, please? Yeah, so what we've seen, I mean, we, we you know, we should be clear, we, we hoover up data just like every other fund management company does to try and inform ourselves as to what's out there. So we have lots and lots of this, but what we've seen in it is that the, the ESG scoring metrics that you get from different sources are very different to each other. Now, there's some sort of academic there's been some academic papers written on this one by, I think it was MIT Sloan, who drilled into this and said, you know, really, this is not that people are getting different data from companies. It's that the that, that ratings providers are interpreting that data in very different ways. So the, the, the challenge here is that if you're trying to invest in a way which aligns with your own values based on some sort of indexing, you know, based off an index or even using a passive fund, um, you're going to get a very different set of delivered values depending on which set of data you happen to be um, referencing. So that that's quite difficult in itself because people, whatever benchmark you decide to run your sustainable portfolio against is in very large part determining your definition of sustainability. And I think there's a, um, there's a slight abdication of responsibility going on because you've got, you've got the, the index providers saying, well, we're going to do this based on rules. Um, I think very often you get perverse outcomes from a rules-based approach because it doesn't capture where companies are, are changing for the better. Um, a lot of this is about management attitude and, um, and ambition 
to reduce carbon footprint and you don't capture that in backwards looking metrics. Um, so the, the, the abdication point is if you've got, so the index providers are really not capturing that forward looking stuff. The passive providers are leaning on the index providers. They're doing the job. They're saying, we're going to run a portfolio against a particular index. So where's the actual company by company analysis? taking place. So I'm, I'm sort of firmly of the view, and this is not just an ESG thing, that the, the, the resource intensity of properly investing in companies, working with management, understanding how they can change for the better, understanding their attitudes in particular in this instance to um, reducing carbon footprinting, um, you know, that's just a, a, a job that you have to undertake by, by sheer hard work. You know, you need a lot of people to engage with a small number of companies. And, and I think that's where the value lies. And then that's, that's where we should be focusing our efforts in order to try and solve some of these problems, not just in sort of hoovering up data, constructing a portfolio in light of that data and sort of considering good, the, the box is ticked and we can all not worry about climate change anymore. I, I mean, and this is almost can't emphasize enough going down that approach may well result in us completely but what really quite uh, unsuccessful approach to tackling the underlying problem. And that's, that's what's terrifying about this is, is the industry does what it often does is reduce it to an exercise in numbers and completely miss the point. So this is the reason for the paper. And it's not, um, I, you may find this peculiar, but it's not really written in an effort to say, isn't Bailey Gifford marvelous? It's much more about, can everyone take a step back and properly think about how we're going to go down these pathways that we need to go down? Um, do you know what? That's a really long answer. The short answer is you can't um, you can't tackle problems by overlaying ESG metrics on a short term investment approach. That's maybe a much cleaner answer for you. It would be great to see a more, more collaborative approach. Um, there's also a debate around um, divestment from the biggest polluters and fossil fuels. And you explain in the paper that this makes sense from uh, climate conscious investors from a bottom up perspective, but not from a top down. Can you explain more around that, please? This is the point that there's a misalignment of of motivations going on if you like and again i don't think any and no one no one's doing this deliberately but if you are an individual pension fund or an individual investor and you want to invest in such a way that you think is responsible whether that's environment or whatever your incentive is to say right i'm just not going to invest in companies that have high emissions intensity for example um it makes sense I'm not part of the problem, um, so, I've, so I've solved something. And that, that sort of, at one level, makes sense, except it doesn't make sense at all if you consider the assets or the companies that are um, highly emitting still exist somewhere. You know, so unless, un unless you know, just because you don't invest in, in, in a, a, an oil company for argument's sake doesn't mean that someone else doesn't invest in the oil company. Now, you do get this. There is an argument there that cost of capital goes up for companies because they're unpopular amongst investors and they don't receive funding so much. But when we're in a world of, you know, companies can be taken private, the unfortunate reality is we're sitting here talking about responsible investing, long-term investing. The industry's talking about it. Pension funds are talking about it. Many individuals are talking about it. But there's a bit of a... Um, there's a whole set of people who are not part of this conversation and will cheerfully buy... Um, companies that are not, you know, and wh where there are loads of externalities that are not being priced into their products, um, and they will continue to survive if we're just passing the parcel in this way. So, the top-down approach is is by far the the better way of thinking about how do we solve our problems. These are system-wide problems. So, the owners of the assets is actually a less important question than. Who are the people who control what? How, who control the assets, and are we improving how we're using those assets in terms of their carbon footprints or whatever it may be? And remember that there are there are lots of companies out there that may be um, high carbon intensity, but they do need to exist. We we can't go through a carbon transition without the metal that makes the wind turbines. You know, it's, it, 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 these companies need to exist. So rather than just say I'm not touching them. I would argue it's a much more constructive approach, at least in some of the cases, is to say, 
you know, we, remember they still have to be good investments. You know, we're not. I think we have to remember what the day job is here. But um, as long as we think these companies are have strong competitive positions and cost advantages and everything else, um, you know, we should we should engage with them to minimize the environmental damage of their activities as we go through the carbon transition. And I think that's a, a, a much more sort of, that, that produces this real change in the real world, which I think is far more important than who happens to own the assets at any given time. There's, a, there's another aspect to this too, um, which you may want, we may come on to in more detail, but I, I think ESG is often looked at as a risk management and in quite a negative light, you know, don't pollute the world. Um, there's a big missing aspect of this. And, I, and again, I don't think you get this from index providers or, or, or you know, the forward looking aspect of this is um, deploying capital, providing capital to the companies that are creating the solutions to this stuff in a way that we don't all have to hugely sacrifice our standard of living is probably the most important thing of all. So there's a whole load of companies that are trying to come up with ingenious ways of new ways of doing things um, at much lower environmental and arguably social cost. Because I don't think what will work is, it, it's, it seems highly improbable to me that, that society at large will just accept a, a reduction in living standards in order to improve environmental standards. The way we're gonna get there is to find new and better ways of doing things. And, and I think there's a whole, slightly missing part of this conversation which is where's the positive capital deployment discussion which is probably far more important than just not holding a oil company you've also consulted mike berners lee a climate change scientist on the paper who said the reported data on which index providers produce carbon metrics may well be understated uh, can you explain that and the implications I think the best way to think about this is, is, is the whole business of measuring environmental impact and social impact is still relatively in its infancy. And what I'm not trying to do here is be critical of those who are moving things forward. And that includes sort of the, the various data gathering companies and index providers. The slight challenge is because people are trying to run businesses, there's a bit of a black box approach to this. So if you go and buy, you know, XYZ index providers data, you're kind of just presented with it as a fait accompli. This is what it is. Um, if, if, if we, what we, what we try to do, we often work with external experts. Um, by definition, they more, they know more about specific topics than we do. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's a general principle that we employ. Um, in this case, Mike has gone off and, and started with a blank sheet of paper and said, how would I think about carbon footprinting some of these companies um, and come up with his own methodology? So it's not a critique of how MSCI or anyone else have done it because, because actually it's not really possible to critique their methodology because it's black box. Um, so he's just done his own thing and he's done it on a number of companies for us now. Now he, I'm sure people know who Mike is. He's clearly leading edge on thinking on this kind of stuff. Um, and he's come up with numbers for some companies which are two or three times greater than those that you're typically getting from the index providers. Of course, bear in mind the numbers you get from the, the data sources are different as well. So there's a bit of a who's right, who's wrong about this. So the way that we've tried to tackle that is to, is to do a completely bottom up assessment on how realistic are some of these numbers. And what he's come up with is that he thinks some of the assumptions that go into these numbers are questionable and particularly around things like mix of energy use which varies massively from one country to the next for instance and, and arguably doesn't get properly captured in the the huge data management exercise which is what the, the data providers have to do and this is back to the point I, 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 that can only get you so far you always have to come back to looking at the specifics of the company situation I think Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, but that brings us to the end of the first of the two pop video series. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks very much. I hope that was useful. And um, if anyone wants to follow up on that, then I guess you know where to find me. Join us for the second and final episode where Stuart will share more snippets from the Rise of ESG paper, including thoughts on self-regulation, governance and engagement.